All right, thank you so much. And uh, once again, thanks everyone for joining us today for another DORA community discussion. Uh, as always, we hope that you've had a chance to download and read the Accelerate State of DevOps report by now. Maybe you've even taken a hard copy and handed it to your manager or left it on their desk. I think that's always a good, solid move for you to do. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today, though, was security. Uh, and why is security such a timely thing for us to discuss as a community? Well, uh, you probably heard OpenSSL released a couple of patched versions this week, some of which are addressing a high security vulnerability. And it, to me, this just reminded, uh, it reminded me pretty uh, immediately of the research that we did this year, specifically around supply chain, software supply chain and the security of your software supply chain. And frankly, a, an OpenSSL patch that came out is a good way for us to think about how does this research apply? How do we uh, see that it manifesting? And so just to recap a couple of quick things that we saw this year in our research. One is that adoption of software supply chain practices and software supply chain security practices has already started. But there's a lot of room for improvement uh, and, and more adoption across different teams. And as you may or may not remember, the way that we assessed like what practices, what capabilities are you doing around software supply chain security, we use two different frameworks, the supply chain levels for software artifacts, or SALSA, and the secure software development framework, or SSDF. Now, SALSA is an emerging standard uh, that Google backs, but is, uh, of course, a community standard. And then the SSDF comes out of NIST, or the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So like I said, adoption has begun, but there's ample room for more and more adoption across the organizations that we surveyed. The other thing that I think is the most important thing is that healthier cultures have a head start. Organizational culture is one of those primary drivers for software development security practices. With higher trust, blameless organizations, more likely to have established some of these practices, certainly more likely than their lower trust organizational cultures. I also think it's interesting how uh, higher trust, you know, treats or, or those, those types of organizations tend to treat failure as opportunities to learn and not sweep them under the rug uh, and not try to figure out who should we fire because of a failure. So I think that's really important. The third bullet here, it provides unexpected benefits. So yeah, of course, uh, if we adopt more security practices, we'll be more secure. Yay, go team, it like works. But there are other additional advantages that it, it provides for our teams. In fact, if you were here last time, we talked about the SEM, our structural equation model, or the BFD, that shows how capabilities predict other capabilities. One of the things that we saw in this year's data was that better security practices tend to lead to a decrease in burnout on your team. Oh, and if you have less burnout, maybe you're better at security, which means you'll be better at less burnout, which means you're better at security. It's a beautiful, virtuous cycle. And then finally, there's a key integration point. That key integration point in particular was continuous integration. So what we saw when we looked at the data was that those teams that had both above average continuous integration and above average security practices tended to have the best organizational performance. And I just find this fascinating and, and uh, part of me feels like it's intuitive, like of course this is, this is real, but we also have the data to back it up. Now, before we move to our discussion, I think uh, there's another key thing here. We oftentimes talk as an industry, as a community about continuous integration. In fact, that's kind of a lie. I think we don't talk about continuous integration a whole lot. I think we talk about CICD a whole lot and we tend to conflate the two and merge them together. CICD, it's just one thing. In our survey and in our, in our research, we are very particular about the differences between the two. So when we talk about continuous integration, we're specifically looking for signals that on your team, there's an automated build process that automatically creates artifacts that can be deployed to any environment. That once those artifacts have been created and maybe in the process of creating them, there's a suite of automated tests that run. 
and that there's a system that runs the build and automated tests on every check-in. If you meet these three criteria, these are some of the ways that we measure whether or not your team is embracing or actually practicing continuous integration. Now, another thing that's important, we talked a little bit about how healthy cultures drive those security practices. Those cultures and process that you have also help determine how well you're doing with continuous integration. In particular, agreeing that fixing a broken build takes priority over any other work. I find, in my experience, this is something that's very easy for us engineers or for a team of engineers to agree to. If the build breaks, we will prioritize fixing that work. But in practice, it really sometimes becomes much more difficult. There are deadlines that we have to meet. There are, you know, a pub I want to get to. Whatever it is, there's a reason to just comment out that test and move on. But the teams that are doing best are those that prioritize fixing this. And doing so also helps us realize that we should make investments in decreasing the amount of time it takes to run our tests, that we should decrease the life of feature branches because the longer they live, the more likely they are to introduce errors. So what I'd really love to do here in the next few minutes is, is have a discussion. How is your team responding this week to a, a critical Oh, sorry, it wasn't critical. It's was only a high severity vulnerability with OpenSSL. Is that something that you are approaching with continuous integration in hand? Is it something where continuous integration might have helped you? And of course, we don't have to talk about the specifics of what you and your team are doing, how you and your team are responding today. We'd love to hear stories of how you responded to Heartbleed. You know, it was almost a decade ago that we all discovered the same or a similar vulnerability in OpenSSL. Are we seven years smarter collectively as an organization, as a team, as a community? I don't know. Let's have a discussion about that. And of course, it's lean coffee, so we can discuss whatever you'd like. Amanda, tell us about this lean coffee thing. Awesome. I just dropped the link to the lean coffee board um, in the chat. So if you want to go ahead, and get started with that, you're just going to join as a guest. So you put in your name, hit join the meeting, and it'll pop you in um, to the, the board where you can start adding topics. I would ask that as I'm talking, please don't vote yet. You can start adding topics, but don't vote. So in case um, you're new to Lean Coffee, what we'll do first is we're going to start with adding topics to the Lean Coffee Table board. Um, then in a few minutes, I will ask you all to vote. You have three votes. You can choose to put all of those votes on one topic, or you can put them across multiple topics. We'll give a couple minutes for voting, or if I see everybody's um, finished voting, I'll just jump into the discussion, the topic that has the most votes. We'll start with that. We'll talk um, about that for about four minutes, and then we'll come to our first group consensus where you'll get icons on the screen where you can say, I'd like to talk about this more, I don't have an opinion, or I'm ready to move on to the next topic. Occasionally, um, if I see a lot of hands up, I may just extend the topic so that we can keep the discussion going without the need for um, the consensus kind of breaking it up. Just encourage, you know, encourage anyone who's comfortable, you know, unmute and jump into that conversation. It's best if we use the raise hand feature, if we have multiple people joining in. Um, we can also use the chat feature here on Google Meet, but also inside the Lean Coffee table, there's ability to add notes. And we do share those out afterwards, so you'll have those um, to refer back to. And I just ask that we all, you know, be thoughtful. There's several of us here. We all have maybe different voices and perspectives and let us all kind of join the conversation and share with one another. 